Hello, and welcome to our monthly Horizon discussion. This is a monthly series of thought leadership, and it's about Ask Me Anything. My name is Massimo Teodoardo. I'm Vice President at Castle LNG Research of McKenzie, and I'm joined by Gavin Law, who is Senior Vice President, Division of Low Carbon Fuel Consulting, Katerina Filipenko, Research Director, Global Gas Markets, and Daniel Toleman, Research Director, Global LNG. Our March Horizon is an assessment of how a carbon tax on imports could transform the global LNG market. Playing with words, we have titled it Call of Duty, partly in reference to taxes, obviously, but also to highlight the need of the LNG industry to reduce its emission footprint while it positions itself as a transitional fuel in the energy transition. The plan for today is rather than go through the insight in depth, as you can read it on bootmed.com slash horizon, <clears throat> is to have a discussion around the topic and the related question from the insights and provide more flavor that you can get from just reading it. And of course, we want to hear from you. Now, as you know, this is a recorded session. However, we are on end during this premiere. So if you do have a question or even just want to express a view, please type it into this question box on your screen and we'll try to answer as many of these questions as possible within this time. Let's now dive straight into the first question. And I want to start with a very open question about really the motivations of why we've been writing this insight. Because to some extent, nobody is really yet talking about an emission import tax LNG, even in Europe. So why have we decided to write this insight? Katerina, if I could start with you, but obviously also want to hear from Gav and Dan. So Katerina, what's the motivation? Um, well, one of the reasons for writing this piece is that regulatory pressure is growing. So as you say, even though the tax itself is not here yet, uh, the EU is gradually tightening regulations and the industry basically needs to be prepared for what may come. Um, and we have already seen a number of new important regulations being put in place or, or expanded over the past couple of months even. Uh, so things like uh, the ETS extending to shipping, uh, we will see gradual increase in the rate uh, over the next three years. And while initially ETS will cover only uh, carbon emissions from 2026 methane and nitrous oxide will be covered too. Um, and then obviously in the end of 2023, uh, the EU also announced this uh, new methane regulations, um, whereby in addition to the stricter controls over methane emissions within the EU, it now extends the um, requirements for monitoring and measuring emissions beyond the EU borders, basically covering countries and uh, companies exporting fuel to the EU. Now, um, at the moment, this is mostly about measuring and monitoring, but it can become a, a base for some sort of taxation further down the line. Um, and also the part of this regulation after 2027, all new import contracts will be required to use a single EU defined uh, methane measuring standard. And, and there will be expectation for importers to meet the standard. And Basically, in the future, you know, as the decarbonization pressures within the EU intensify and as the EU is going to be setting increasingly ambitious targets uh, on uh, reducing emissions, we, I think we can expect strengthening of regulations covering both methane and uh, broader carbon emissions. Uh, so, for example, for methane, we can't rule out the extension of um, application of that same methane standards on all fossil uh, fuel inputs, not just new contracts and uh, also potentially introducing some form of tax for the emissions that are exceeding this um, uh, like expected level. And uh, as far as the broader carbon emissions are concerned, we might see the EU including LNG in its carbon border adjustment mechanism and uh, probably establishing uh, some sort of, uh, sort of import tax based on the prevailing ETS carbon prices. And then again, none of these are here yet, but we think that the industry needs to be prepared. And uh, that was one of the motivations to write this insight. Thanks. Thanks, Karina. So regulation is increasing, but, but, but what's the industry thinking? Gav, I mean, you talk to, to, to players about emissions probably on a daily basis. What's, what, what's your perception about how the industry is thinking about this at the moment? 
Well, yeah, since we um, launched the first uh, LNG emissions tool, that conversation has just increased. Um, the industry is more and more keen to try and be transparent um, and provide the information that the, 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 the sector is wanting. So I think the fact is they know that this is coming. The, the, the pressure is only growing um, to, to, to increase the amount of transparency around emissions. And also it's, it's about um, refuting some of the crazy stuff that's out there. Um, it's trying to bring some sense of clarity. So there's a real desire to get clarity around what the emissions are associated with the LNG value chain. So I think people know that the, the, the pressure is, is, is only going to increase and they need to respond appropriately. Thanks, Gav. I mean, Dan, you, I mean, we've talked about increased pressure, but, but what's the perception from some of the operators, you know, in, in places like Australia, where, where, where you're based, where, where some of the regulation is tightening? What's, what, what's the perception there, for example? Yeah, it's a really hot topic in Australia at the moment, how Australia decarbonises its LNG industry. The government re recently introduced a safeguard mechanism, which outlines how emissions need to come off for Australia to meet its net zero targets. And operators are looking at what things they can do to reduce their emissions, how much it will cost, and whether they can get a premium on their LNG if they do reduce those emissions. Okay, thanks. And so I think I see... I Sorry, but I think I will also see that in the U.S. is that the the methane legislation yeah. that we've seen in the U.S. is is adding to that story, and and people can see that there's an opportunity here to to clean up some of the the U.S. LNG, which is generally seen as as higher emissions, and so the methane legislation in the U.S. is just driving that is that driving that trend towards methane reduction. So we're not we're not probably there yet in terms of having taxes, but certainly it's something that it's, it's all conveying towards increased pressure and, and something that could become pretty real pretty soon. Okay, so thanks for that. Um, let's get into the details now. Gavin, let, let me start with you. I'd like probably to start clarifying one thing, uh, which is actually uh, you know one of the questions that we have received ahead of this recording. So, you know, probably everybody agrees that gas produces half of the CO2 uh, versus coal, you know, once or two fuels are, are burned. But if you consider the full cycle emissions and include the meat and fugitives, is gas and LNG still better than coal? You know, some reports seem to suggest that that's not the case. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the fact is that what we've seen are some reports that that take exceptional circumstances and use them as being the, the the norm and i think that's just not true i think what we're seeing is that in 99 percent of cases lng even as accounting for things like fugitive emissions uh, methane losses etc that that me that uh, lng is still way better than coal so it's it's important that we actually base some of these um, ideas on the basis of fact rather than specific um, measurements that have been made in a specific setting and look at the general emissions associated with methane. I think at the moment, essentially, most LNG that's traveling around the world at the moment is way better than than the 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 coal uh, emissions that you would you would see, um, and there's absolutely no doubt that there have been uh, cargoes of LNG that may have been higher than coal because the the methane fugitives were three four percent, but that's pretty rare and and it should not be taken as the the standard for evaluating LNG. Okay. Okay, let's let's talk a bit more about you know the different elements that contribute to the emissions of uh, of LNG you know across the value chain. And I know you've done a lot of work in this area. I mean, first of all, you know how difficult it is to gather this information, and and, and what drives uh, you know methane and carbon emission. Uh, you know, in one of the charts that you that we show in the in the report, uh, you know, we show that US is quite. 
you know, it's quite higher in terms of both methane and, and, and carbon emission. And perhaps, you know, just to pick up on what you were saying before also, can you tell us, you know, if you take the whole kind of emission, uh, you know, across the value chain, including, including when LNG is, or gas is burned, how much, you know, the scope one and two emission are in relation to the kind of scope three, so when it is burned? Sorry, pretty pretty long question. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, look, in terms of how difficult it is, it is difficult. Uh, and the fact is that trying to get this information for projects from, you know, as diverse locations as Papua New Guinea to Equatorial Guinea, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult to try and, and look at projects on a common basis. And that's one of the things that, that we've really tried to do is to use a very common and detailed methodology to look at projects. So it is difficult to compare. I think what we've seen in North America, yes, is that emissions are generally higher. And that the fact that the emissions are higher is related to the amount of activity that's related to the production and getting the gas to the liquefaction plant. The liquefaction plants themselves are actually some of the best in the world in terms of emissions intensity, but it's actually producing and getting that gas to the, to the, the liquefaction plant that, that adds so much to the emissions intensity. And that's a lot related to methane loss. Now, methane loss is something that the U.S. has taken very seriously and you're seeing a lot more of what's called certified gas, or used to be called responsibly sourced gas, where where the emissions associated with those are reduced are reduced. But essentially, the the um, emissions intensity of the U.S. is higher, and there's no getting away from that. Both from a CO2 content and also a methane, much higher from a methane perspective. But the methane challenge is being addressed. And we're okay. seeing a lot more certified gas, and we're going to see that drive down the value chain into things like uh, gathering and boosting and and uh, processing and, and also into transmission as well. So I think the fact is in five, six years' time, we may not be talking much about methane being a problem in the industry. We're going to be focused on other things because I think that the, the methane story is one that's really being being addressed. And does it apply to just upstream, you think, or also across the value chain in terms of processing? And Cause that's quite difficult, right? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, methane loss is very much focused on the upstream and the midstream. Um, right. The liquefaction plants, the methane losses are exceedingly low unless there's some kind of problem. Um, and shipping, yes, shipping is, is an area where methane slip on certain vessels is much higher than, than people would like. And a lot of the shipping companies are doing stuff to address that. So I think the fact is methane is the low-hanging fruit. It's the focus of people's attention because there's such a big win to be had from reduction. And I think the fact is that the the legislation we're seeing in the US through the IRA and maybe, you know, legislation in Europe, it's just going to help prod that along so that there's an increase in yeah. the in that in that process. And and we'll talk about that as we talk about some of the analysis that we've done on how a tax could actually help achieve that. So so we we'll come back to that discussion. But that if I can if I can move to you now. So obviously, you know, different projects, uh, you know, have different emission intensity as 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 Gal was talking about. But obviously projects uh, you know, uh, a difference in terms of cost, despite or, or in addition to uh, you know to, to to the emission intensity. So Again, if we assume, as we've done in our analysis, that we we associate a tax or a cost, you know, to the emission that each project produces, how how does the economics of projects change? You know, how much more expensive they become, and uh, and and who's going to pay for it after all? Yeah, it's a good question. So the way I like to think about this is via cost stack or a break even analysis, and the first key takeaway you have is the cost of all the projects will go up when you put in a carbon tax. Now, the second key change is the merit order of these projects may change. So if you've got a low emission project, the, the impact of a carbon tax will be less than if you have a high emission project. 
So what we can see is those high emission projects, they, they move further to the right in terms of your cost stack and your low emission projects, that they're the ones that are more advantaged when you put, put in a tax or a, or a cost. Now, in terms of who will pay, my view here is that these costs will ultimately be passed on to the buyer. In some situations, you may be able to pass those costs a little bit further downstream as well. But So the cost initially incurred by, by the operator, but ultimately, once you factor in the market, I, I think those costs end up being paid by the buyer. Well, I suppose that depends on 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 where the tax will be will, will be implemented and, and and where they would be implemented, which is something that you know we can certainly uh, you know discuss further. Um, I mean, just as a sense of materiality. So, I mean, we we showed some charts in in that report, but I mean, if you include a carbon tax of a hundred dollars, um, I mean, how, how how much the the cost of projects could increase? Is it you know twenty cents, one dollars, three dollars? Can can you give us a bit of a yeah, sure. So uh, one of the lower emission projects is around a dollar and your higher emission projects can be around $2 at the $100 carbon tax. So you're talking about often a, a 20, maybe even a, close to a 30% increase on the cost of that LNG. So it is quite quite considerable when you think about it, especially when, yeah, when you're considering these aren't cheap uh, sources of LNG. Okay, thanks. So... You know, clearly, you know, carbon costs change the cost curve. And, and as you were saying, you know, the higher the cost, you know, the, the, the more obviously, you know, the additional cost. Now, let me turn to, to Katerina now. Um, you know, in the report, you know, you, you talk about, uh, you know, some analysis that we've done, including, uh, you know, considering different uh, taxation of methane and carbon. Um, and we've talked about, you know, well, well, you know, clearly, you know, pays for it and and, and the incentives that, you know, that that are required. It's, it's to some extent some sort of, you know, carrot and stick in terms of trying to push, uh, you know, players to to try and decarbonize, but also providing the appropriate incentives. So, it, you know, what we've assumed, I suppose, it's it's a it's a carbon tax uh, or or a, or a emission tax in Europe, which is effectively the stick, right? What what are those scenarios that you have considered, and, and what are the implications of, of of these scenarios? Well, yeah, we we have tested a couple of scenarios in our new lens gas and LNG market model. Uh, it's an optimization tool that basically helped us to see how different levels of emission taxes can impact trade flows, trade patterns, and prices. Um, and uh, we also looked at different scopes of uh, taxation because effectively some steps are more likely than others. So, for example, the introduction of EU methane tax seems much more real than a wider tax on emissions. Um, so we basically ran one scenario that looked at the EU applying tax only on methane emissions. And we ran another scenario where we looked at the EU applying a broader tax on uh, all emissions, so methane and, and broader carbon. Um, and we also assume that EU ETS will be used as a reference point for taxation. So basically similar to what is um, used in the current application of CBAM. Uh, and we assumed a hundred dollars carbon price, but obviously EU ETS is very, very volatile and this is expected to strengthen as emissions are capped more. So to step through the scenarios, in the methane only scenario, the impact on prices is moderate because methane contributes a relatively small share of total emissions. Um, so prices in Europe do increase uh, because Europe still requires US LNG on the margin. And uh, because as we discussed already, US LNG's methane intensity is still higher than most of the other producers. Um, but interestingly, the increase is only about $0.6 per MBTU, so that's about 6.5%, as uh, most of the emissions still come from carbon rather than, than methane. And we also see this effect that, that non-US producers uh, can benefit from this premium and will have additional incentives to decrease their methane intensity to basically capture most of, uh, more of this uh, premium. Um, and we also kind of uh, refer to methane reduction being a relatively low panning fruit from the cost perspective, but but maybe Gav can elaborate more on that later on. Um, so in the way this tax kind of achieves its goal, it creates incentives to reduce methane emissions, and it creates incentives to to capture this European premium 
while at the same time keeping the impact on European consumers relatively constrained as the prices are not increasing too much. But if we apply the tax to the wider uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the impact is much more pronounced. So we see that European prices increase by as much as 18% for about $1.7 per MBTU. Um, and this is, again, because US LNG is still required uh, in the in the medium term at the margin. And uh, producers are expecting, the US producers are expecting to get the same netbacks from selling into Europe as, as they would from delivering into non-taxed Asian market. Um, but in this case, we also see that the market is more likely to reshuffle. So more of the lower carbon LNG producers will get attracted by this high European premium. And over time, they will manage to effectively displace US LNG in the European mix. And particularly, this becomes true as European demand declines. Um, as we see, European demand decline accelerate after 2030 and towards 2050. So basically, we're saying that by 2050, there will be enough low carbon LNG to cover European LNG imports and to displace the higher carbon US LNG. And meanwhile, the higher carbon US LNG producers will be increasingly targeting those markets where the tax is not applied. So there will be more optimization of their flows. And this effectively will bring down the European premium over time. So that means that the incentives to, to invest in the longer term decarbonization initiatives will, will decrease over time. Okay, so... You know what 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 looks like is a you know a tax on Europe might be quite limited in terms of scope, but but what about if you consider countries that might be amenable for for a tax similar to Europe, let's say, uh, you know Japan and South Korea? What 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 would that mean in terms of in terms of you know how players could optimize flows and uh, uh, you know eventually again drive down you know drive you know invest in the capitalization. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, you say the geographical scope of taxation is uh, an extremely important variable, and uh, realistically, we can't expect price-sensitive countries to introduce tax, which uh, which will potentially increase prices. Um, but um, as you mentioned, countries like Japan or South Korea might follow the the EU in establishing this carbon tax. Uh, so we ran a scenario where Japan and South Korea also introduce a carbon tax similar to the EU. And it has a similar impact uh, as the previous scenario. So it increases prices in Japan and South Korea also by about 18%. So it brings back their premium over the EU. And similar to the previous scenario, low carbon producers try to capture this premium and displace US LNG. But the broad application of the tax in this scenario limits, uh, in a way, limits LNG reshuffling. And uh, as EU, uh, US LNG is still required in Japan and South Korea at the margin, prices in those regions will need to uh, remain high to reflect the higher cost of US LNG still supporting this premium and it's required at the margin. Okay, so it's effectively a big reshuffling. I mean, in the you know in the report we talk about a, a bifurcated market, but I think it's interesting. The irony of a big reshuffling is perhaps you know the fact that by by optimizing flows, you know, you actually allocate LNG in, in in not in an optimal way, and so you know the irony might actually be that there is more emission associated with shipping than you know than than otherwise. Now. I mean, we've talked about you know these 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 taxes, but but I'd like to now understand and talk with you guys about you know how expensive it is you know to decarbonize. You know, we've talked about a carbon price of a hundred dollar, for example, but but how expensive it is to decarbonize, and also you know what are LNG developers actually doing to to try and 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 reduce. Uh, you know, and reduce emission. Uh, I'd like to turn to, to, to Dan and Gav. Dan, Dan, maybe maybe I'll start with you, right? So, so what are the options to decarbonize and what is, you know, what are play is doing, um, you know, to, to try and achieve those, those, those CO2 reduction or meter reduction? Yeah, so there's quite a few options. In the upstream, really, it's about the certified gas. For your venting emissions, reservoir CCS is one of the key options. And then there's, of course, your, your liquefaction emissions. And there's a couple of options there. We can look at electric drive, post-combustion CCS. 
Some companies are even considering hydrogen as a way to reduce those emissions. If I think about what companies are doing, one of the key things that we're seeing is something that generates small wins, but they're looking to incorporate renewables into processes to, to take away some of the combustion emissions. In terms of how much it costs, one thing that I hear a lot is CCS can be quite cheap. And a lot of people in my region, they refer to Santos's Mumba CCS development. Santos quotes $24 a tonne. When I look around the LNG set of CCS developments, I, I see the numbers being quite a bit higher than this for reservoir CCS projects. Generally speaking, between $70 and $100 per tonne is where these come in. So it is quite, quite expensive and quite a big capital outlay for these projects. Now in the pre-FID space, we do see operators going down the route of electric drive, which really future-proofs some of these projects, assuming that they can get renewable energy going forwards. But for the on-stream projects, it, it's quite challenging if you've already got gas combustion. You, you, it's expensive to retrofit electric drive. Also post-combustion CCS it is, uh, you know, you're talking around $150 per tonne and even with a tax credit, it, it, that may only bring that down to around $70 per tonne. So it is quite expensive and quite a big outlay for, for some of these operators. Thanks. I mean, Gav, what's, what, what's your perspective? I mean, what, what, what do you see in the market people trying to do and, and, and what's needed really to, again, to make those investments? I, I think Dan hit on a point there. I think there's an expectation uh, is that the LNG emissions are relatively high. People see that and they see them as this is something that's going to be easy to do, that, that reduction and methane mitigation is or uh, uh, carbon mitigation is something that's relatively easy. It is not. And I think what we see outside of methane, forgetting methane for a moment, reduction of CO2 emissions is extremely hard, particularly, as Dan said, on existing projects. So the things that you can do really are about tinkering around the edges, trying to to, to, to repower some of the, the requirements for uh, electric power in the, in the plant, um, you know, using CCS. I mean, CCS is an expensive thing to do. So ultimately, there's very limited things that you can do. Post, you know, post-construction CCS is hard. Incorporating CCS into a, a new project may be more cost-effective, but it's still going to be significant. And we look to examples like Gorgon. We look to examples like Snowvit. These have not been cheap opportunities to, to, to mitigate carbon. Now, if you come to methane, Methane, uh, is, you know, like anything, methane has its own uh, marginal abatement cost curve. So some of that methane emissions, particularly around North America, are, you know, can be mitigated relatively cheaply. Um, but as you cut that easy stuff, the, the quick wins away, then it gets more and more expensive. And I suspect that there will come a point where you just say, well, we just cannot do any more in methane reduction because it's just not cost effective. So I think the, the main point takeaway is, you know, this, the, the, the mitigation of carbon emissions from the LNG chain is not an easy thing to do. And once you've done the first 5 10% in terms of savings, after that, it really becomes challenging and really becomes costly. Right. Okay, so, you know, we've talked about carbon taxes and, and how they impact the projects, and we've talked about how difficult it is to, to, to effectively try to make investment in some of these projects to try and achieve those, uh, you know, those, 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 those you know, the, the decarbonization. So, but, but what does, what does this mean for the grand goal of decarbonizing, of decarbonizing, right? What, what, what kind of stick and carrots are needed to try then achieve decarbonization at scale, Gav? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the fact is that what we're seeing at the moment is, is evidence of a, a process. So the focus is on methane because it's the quick win and it's relatively low cost. But what we're going to need to see are carbon prices 
that are significantly higher than fifty dollars. They've got to be a hundred, one hundred and fifty, even higher to to show major impact on decarbonisation. Um, you know, incentives around cost recovery, or in in the in the US forty five Q that allows for tax support in doing things like CCS are are a real help in terms of moving that forward. But they don't they're not the whole answer. And so I think what you'll need to see is a bit of incentive through tax benefits like you see with 45Q and a carbon price that that drives that that desire to say, well, if if uh, you know if I'm going to sell my LNG, I'm gonna have to pay a cost. And therefore, I'm better off actually decarbonizing at scale. And that at scale means things that really move the needle, things that that cut you know emissions by twenty, thirty percent. Right. So, I suppose you know, as as you were saying, one of the kind of key key points that we've been trying to make in the in, in this report is that you need a much higher carbon price. We talk about something above 150, perhaps as high as 200. I think we also talk about a carbon price that you know that doesn't need to be limited to Europe or even South South Korea and Japan, right? It does need to be a carbon price that it's it's adopted much more widely to make sure that the signals are are very much there. So it's you know it's time to to wrap up now, and I'd like to conclude with a final question for you know for each of you. Katerina, we, we've talked about, again, this importance of a global carbon tax and, and a carbon tax that needs to be pretty high. But I want to come back to some of the things that you were saying before, right? So, but how realistic that is? And, you know, we're going to see the EU trying to do something really about this. And, and what about the others? Well, that that's a great question. And I think, let, let's face it, the global unified approach to tax and carbon in fuel imports is extremely unrealistic. Right, so we are we are likely to see only a handful of countries with the strongest decarbonization um, aspirations to actually go ahead, um, and even there, a lot depends on the timing and the region's uh, acute kind of priorities in the moment. So right now, uh, when we're talking about the EU, the topic of uh, supply security is uh, kind of a, a, a bit. Um, e- has has a bit eased compared to 2022, but it is still very much on the table for the EU and the bloc uh, still does need to attract my LNG. So a broader carbon tax that might discourage some high emitting LNG suppliers from sending carbons into the EU is probably unlikely in the next couple of years. And in this market situation, I think the EU methane tax is uh, more real. It can show that the EU is taking measures, um, but at the same time, uh, the price increase will be limited and it won't necessarily see um, a large, uh, large-scale large reshuffle of cargos. Um, but as we see more supply arrive to the market in the second half of 2020s, uh, and there are even risks of oversupply potentially, an introduction of a broader carbon tax may be uh, much more palatable. So I'd say it's, it's still a few years away, but it is not too far off. So we shouldn't be surprised if Europe imposes it uh, as soon as late 2020s, early 2030s. And to some extent, it's a similar situation in countries like Japan and South Korea. Um, uh, so, so it is still very possible that we, we might see uh, some tax there. But I don't think we will see import tax in any other major importers, particularly the emerging Asian markets. Um, their priority still remains improving access to energy, supporting economic growth, reducing emissions by switching away from coal to gas. And all these factors, they are very sensitive to price. So we don't expect them to introduce any sort of import tax on gas emissions. And it's important to also realize that the countries that will introduce the tax, like Europe, South Korea, and uh, Japan, their share in global LNG imports will decline substantially. So by 2050, they will be contributing like less than a fifth of uh, global LNG imports, so this the share of premium markets will go uh, down. Right. Okay. So possibly Europe uh, or Japan and South Korea very very unlikely for emerging markets to include the, the most. Uh, you know, if if someone does include the possible, most likely outcome is a bifurcated market. 
so much uncertainty and again perhaps not much action there um under this environment dan what's what's your advice to you know to to lng producers or indeed to lng stakeholders and you know across across the industry yeah one of the key things for me is to look through your portfolios and there might be sometimes where you have an asset where you might be able to share the costs of decarbonization in both indonesia and malaysia i think ccs costs could be cost recoverable and that may make it quite attractive for you to consider decarbonization projects in those regimes my other advice would be message that this can be quite challenging whilst you should celebrate your small wins it, it is worth noting that uh, a lot of the options for decarbonizing the lng industry are quite tricky right gavin final thoughts yeah i think i think from from an lng player perspective is the first thing is understand your emissions so that get to grips with where your major problems are and what the issues are around uh the the key points of of, of mitigation look for the quick wins you know, what can you do? Methane's always been in the US has been a quick win, but what other quick wins are there available that are relatively low cost and can be managed within the context of relatively low carbon prices? But I think the third thing is get prepared. Uh, get prepared to think about what happens when carbon prices do go up, because eventually they will. It's just a matter of, of time. And I think that from a wider stakeholder perspective, I would extend that to governments and regulators to accept and understand what they're asking for. Because I think what there is a clarity uh, in, in, there's a lack of clarity in those, those bodies, regulators, governments as to what can be achieved at what cost. Because I think the, the, what's happening uh, in, in a lot of countries where governments are putting pressure, regulators are putting pressure, that ex there's an expectation is the companies can pay for it. And so ultimately, I think is the better understanding of what actually can be achieved and what is reasonable to expect the companies to do um, in a particular setting. One thing's clear is that by being too vociferous in what you do and what you call for, then you're, you've got a real danger that you make your LNG sector uh, uncompetitive. And I think about Australia now in terms of, of the safeguard mechanism. Can you Could you move into a situation where Australian LNG just becomes uncompetitive? Right. Okay, well, that's us uh, at time. Thank you very much for joining us and a big thank you to our panel for a very interesting debate and discussion of what really it's a very important topic. I think, you know, the be prepared uh, warning, it's something that I think really sticks out uh, in, terms of, in terms of this discussion. Before we wrap up, I would like to just remind you that you can read all our Horizons thought leaderships and sign up for our weekly insight at woodmac.com slash horizons. And please, Keep an eye on LinkedIn for all the details of our upcoming Horizon Live events. Thank you for coming and see you next time.